So, ownables. Um, this is where we return to the two-phase cycle. So, a nice simple example of a mutable object in which the, the value changes with use would be a counter that can only count up. Maybe this counter is like an odometer where the higher the number, the less valuable it is. Um, so it has an increment method that only counts up. Uh, and the assay is provided by this describe method that returns the current count. Uh, it's, it's a self-assaying, it's, it's describing itself, but its self-description is as credible as its behavior itself. It's coming from the same piece of code. To make it into an ownable, we wrap it using this make ownable uh, function, uh, where when you call make ownable with the real counter, it creates this new ownable counter that is a uh, revocable forwarder forwarding messages to the original counter. So in this case, it forwards the increment message, but instead of forwarding the described message as well, instead it's, it provides its own make transfer invitation method uh, that's purely there in the ownable counter. And the make transfer in, uh, invitation method being a me the ownable counter is the thing that's given out to as the object capability that others can use. Uh, and since it's given out, they can invoke make transfer invitation. And when they do, make transfer invitation first um, sets counter to zero, I'm sorry, to undefined, severing the access from the ownable counter to the original counter, rendering the ownable counter at this point useless. Uh, the next thing is it sends a make invitation method from the contract to Zoe, um, and the make invitation uh, has these three arguments. The handler, will, which we'll get to, but that's basically a callback, it's a piece of code. The call site is by convention a literal string that uniquely identifies a particular call site in the code of the smart contract this appears in. Uh, and details are the self-description gotten from the describe. So we see over here, we got the details by calling the underlying, the real counters describe, and we then use that up here in the invitation, so here, which is to say that the count at the moment is one, two, three, four. So having sent off the make invitation, uh, we get back this invitation. And this invitation is an e-write. Uh, it's, um, it's an e-write that is not itself exercisable, but it is exclusively transferable. Um, uh, it is, uh, in this case it's saying, it's, it's an e-write that says, you could count up from whatever the, the captured count is. And and the, notice that the real counter, while this e-write exists, while this is active, the real counter continues to exist. It still has an increment method on it, but it's encapsulated. It's not uh, visible to anyone else. Nobody can reach it, and therefore nobody can mutate it while the e-write exists. So the e-write's description remains valid, just like with the vacated house, uh, essentially revoking that reference to the real counter has vacated it with regard to the possibility of mutation. The, this is the, the handler in question that we included in the invitation is just a piece of code that will make a new ownable counter referring to the same or original real counter. And the, the offer operation uh, is the means by which an invitation is redeemed uh, to participate in a smart contract to get the seat, and in this case, also to get a new real counter. 
So the result of the, the invoking the handler is that we've now invalidated the invitation. The invitation itself has been used up. Um, and instead, the offerer, the one who, who, who redeemed the invitation, now has a new real counter. So the key thing here is that we've got be arbitrary behavior written out as code in a new smart contract, and we still need to satisfy our need to assay things. Now, this creates a burden on someone who would understand what rights they are to read some code within the contract and try to figure out what the code means. Uh, and obviously, uh, code understanding in general can be intractable, but the author of the code can try to write the code such that somebody reading the code and inspecting it can understand what it means. And this is, again, where formal verification would be tremendously useful as an element in an overall body of evidence. Um, so, the, so the description, uh, of the description that appears to describe the right is again starts by naming an issuer, in this case the invitation issuer, that's an issuer run by Zoe itself for these invitations. And then the, the rest of the description in the invitation issuer um, is a counter installation. Installation is the, 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 the static code that's running, but the fully linked transitive body of code. So exactly the transitive, transitively linked body of code all the way through that's running. Um, uh, the counter instance, the particular instance of that code that represents this running smart contract. Uh, the call site, which again uh, identifies by convention uniquely one call site within that smart contract so that somebody trying to verify what this invitation means knows where in that contract to start looking. And then the details, which comes from the, the mutable object's own self-description. So altogether, we've gotten back to our two-phase cycle, like with the house, where you have an ownable object that's mutable. Uh, you've got the uh, invitation that is exclusively transferable with credible assay. They both refer behind the scenes to the real counter, but the real counter is never exposed, and you've got this two-phase cycle. But the other thing I want to emphasize, to emphasize here, bring into the visual language, bring back to the visual language, is that by making an offer with an invitation, that participant also gets a seat for further participating in the contract. That's actually where seats come from in our framework, and the handler got, um, that was invoked in making the offer, it got one of these seat resolver things for providing the contract the ability to designate which party uh, to, um, to change the allocation of, to name in those atomic rearrange mess messages. So this is the big aha that I, I wanted to reveal in this talk, and I should um, uh, which is both the seat abstraction and the seat resolver abstraction were not designed with ownability in mind. They were designed just as object capabilities with good object capability design rules, but before we had, had a, a um, coherent notion of ownables or, or anticipated doing them, nevertheless, we found that making those objects into ownables was tremendously valuable. So instead of giving out the real seat, you give out an ownable wrapper of the seat that has this make transfer invitation, likewise with the seat resolver. Um, and the fact that it's useful, and because they're just adding a method to, what, to the existing protocol without changing the existing protocol, this is an intervention that we can do compatibly within an existing mature system with lots of code already using the existing protocols. So this big surprise that we can do this should not have been as much of a surprise as it was to us because good object capability design 
already follows Tribble's first law of object capabilities to reify distinctions in authority as distinct objects. So in this case, the, right, the, the seat representing the right to collect the payouts, the, the, the seat resolver representing the right to determine what the payouts are within the constraints of offer safety. So in general, when you distinct objects represent the th distinct authorities, we should ask the question, does the, uh, the authority is a valuable thing to have if the value itself is transferable value, which it not always is, but in this case it happens to be. If the value is transferable value, you should at least consider making the object in question into an ownable, which you can, again, do typically compatibly in place. So making the seat into an ownable has means that you can sell the right to collect the payouts. So Alice, having gone into the auction and placed bid, um, maybe she loses interest in the auction and she just wants to sell to somebody else her right to collect, to collect whatever those payouts are, either a refund or the awarded good. This is what's known in finance as a conditional option, as an option whose payoff depends on other factors. Um, More interestingly, the seat resolver made into an ownable enables what in finance is called order routing. Maybe the original contract that got the seat resolver saying, well, Alice has you know, made available $42 and wants ticket, um, ticket for seat 3F, maybe the original contract is in a position to say, well, you know, there's another contract elsewhere in the network in which the market is thicker or whatever. It represents a better opportunity to fulfill this contract, to fulfill, the, the, to fulfill Alice's needs. So by turning the seat resolver into a transfer invitation that can be transferred, it can then credibly transfer it to another contract where the other contract then redeems it for a seat resolver and determines the payout still with all this order routing still preserving all of the offer safety constraints. So uh, that uh, concludes the slides, and now I will take final questions. Oh, I want to emphasize one qualification before I take questions, which is uh, in just the same way that I showed the simple piece of code for the mint and then the more complicated piece of code to say I've hidden what's really happening, uh, you know, complexity that doesn't bear on the points that I'm making, uh, there's been similar sort of shortcuts throughout the talk. Everything I've said is correct and realistic in the abstract, but the actual system is more complicated in ways that I didn't explain. and this final step of making the seat and seat resolver uh, into ownables is not a step that we've taken yet. That, that step is still in progress. Okay, uh, questions? I have a question, but I think you may just answered it. Um, so you were mentioning how ownables sort of have like this described, the which they describe themselves. I can imagine a situation in which, like an old elevator car, where it'd be very nice if you could rewind you know, that, that the actual counter. And so now I'm thinking about like malicious ownables. Like is it in this sort of trust model where you have the mutation that's going on, would it be helpful to either say like track those mutations on chain somewhere so you can sort of verify them, or use something like zero knowledge proofs to do verify over Q to assess Either like third-party software or something like that, so you can do it in a high-trust way and maybe get rid of some of that risk. Yeah, uh, all of that would be valuable, uh, and uh, all of those are, uh, I would put in the category of additional evidence for increasing confidence. Um, the, uh, you know, I talked about how, yeah, 
how to assay behavior. I talked about how um, a, a malicious upgrade of the auctioneer cannot violate the offer safety. Uh, in the case of ownables, the behavior is introduced by code and smart contracts, where that code itself is also still subject to upgrade and therefore subject to malicious upgrade. So, um, so when you read, so actually a third field here, that, I'm sorry, a, a fifth field here that should have been in the assay behavior is the description has to have adequate information about the governance arrangement around upgrade so that somebody reading, you know, looking at the invitation deciding, can I trust this counter to continue to operate as I think it will? Let's say only counting up. Um, you not only have to look at the transit of code and the instance, uh, you also have to say, well, what body of, you know, what, what group of electors is, uh, that forms the governing body for being able to decide to upgrade the code of the counter, and what's their quorum rule? What is the rule by which their individual votes are composed together to make a decision to upgrade? And if you don't trust that body under that voting rule to make good faith decisions about future behaviors, then the description is not, the, the description doesn't simply represent the current behavior. The description, by the time you, you redeem it, you might be redeeming it for a future behavior that was determined by a bad governance upgrade decision. Do we have more questions? Just uh, to make it clear for me, what, like where, who, who um, owns, for want of a better term, the counter while uh, sort of the, the like, so it seems to me like the, the, the ownership of the counter is transferred into the e right Is that the correct so, way to think about it? So the, the, the way to think about it, I'm going to go back to our, so the way to think about it is the two-phase cycle. Both phases are ownership, they're, but they're only ownership because they're inside this two-phase cycle. So while you have it as the ownable object on the left, you just have an object capability that's exercisable, but because one of the methods on that exercisable object is make transfer invitation, you can vacate the house in order to sell it. So while you're living in the house, we would still describe it as you own the house, but you own the house because you can vacate it and sell it. it once you've vacated it and you've put it on the market, you still own it until somebody buys it. So both phase, in both phases, you own it because you have the capacity to go around the cycle. That's right. Okay. Right. Yes. Um, so maybe I have a follow-up to that. So if, if I understand correctly, um, what you are saying here, maybe it's easier to think about the first example. Um, I can't really make an ownable out of part of an object, right? Because in the first example, um, I would like to say that I have at least um, this amount of money in the purse, and then I can transfer that to someone else, right? Uh, but if I recall, if I understand the illustrations on your slides correctly, this isn't really something that's happening. What I need to do is I need to create a new purse. I need to transition the money to that purse, right? And then I basically, I make that purse an ownable, right? So I. Yeah. Turn an entire object into an ownable. So the, the, the key thing, the, I think the, the slide we've got up actually illustrates this r rather well. The way you realize ownables on top of object capabilities is the real object with the real mutable state is encapsulated. You never revealed that. The role that you had been, like with, when we made the seat into an ownable, the, the thing that we're currently exposing as the real seat and making the seat into an ownable 
we move that real one into the encapsulated one, we wrap it with the ownable wrapper, and everywhere where we're currently exposing the real seat, we expose the ownable wrapper seat instead. So you could, you could, you could do the same thing with the purse. Now, since purses are sort of part of the infrastructure by which we're realizing e-rights out of object capabilities in the first place, it kind of hurts my brain a little bit um, to think about doing it for the purses themselves. Uh, but it's, it would be an extension of sort of what we've, what we've done anyway in making the seats and seat resolvers into ownables. We've kind of taken this whole ownable notion and folded it in on itself. It started off purely as something that was on top of the level, the Zoe level of abstraction. And now that we've invented that, we've moved it down into the Zoe infrastructure itself to make Zoe more, more expressive and flexible. That is correct. That is correct. Uh, and this goes back to the point I was making earlier, that the point I was making about reference capabilities do not give you a local theory of remote misbehavior. They still give you strong guarantees locally that help you statically reason about what's happening locally. So, um, so this you know, falls into the same category as, as, as we were discussing with formal verification or local static type systems. Anything that gives you more confidence for reasoning about local behavior gives you the ability to read the code or give somebody who's, who's inspecting it and looking at the code, trying to understand what the code means, gives them stronger evidence that they understand what the code means. You just need to, to make sure you don't confuse yourself at mistaking that as a theory of, of, um, of what's guaranteed about remote misbehavior. One last thing. Um, I wanted to ask if you, so we, we prepared like an um, economy centric uh, motivation for, for the system, right? And I was curious, maybe piggybacking a bit on, on Tobias asking, like, does this work with relation to capabilities, um, or fractional capabilities? Um, do you have uh, like a more CS centric or algorithm centric motivation for some? fragment of the system because I was trying to pattern match it to like some some need that could be fulfilled by the type system. So um, I think I see like some relationship to an obscure fragment of Rust where they have something like um, two-phase borrows um, where sometimes it's necessary to create a pointer um, which can become owned but um, only after a certain point. Right? So before it becomes known, it doesn't actually forbid other mutable pointers, right? But after it becomes known, all, all previous mutable pointers need to be given up. Right. So that actually sounds a bit like an ownable. And um, do you have other examples like this? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the, 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 um, I, the classic fractional permissions example is readers, writers. Um, so, Readers, writers is sort of a, a pure transition between uh, something that that is more transmissible, more shareable, because you've given up mutability, and then you have to you have to to gather things together into a narrower access in order to re-enable mutability, and then you can go back and forth between the writing mode and the reading mode. Uh, now, the difference, I would say, uh, in, in all these cases is that the, the transition back to the mutable form is forced in the sense that if you had shared the e-write, then anybody using the, you know, redeeming the e-write with an offer has used up everybody's form of the e-write. 
and likewise in the other direction. In both cases, you have a forced transition. Is that uh, any, if you had shared the, the mutable ownable with others, then anybody invoking make transfer invitation revokes it, preventing everyone from using it. Whereas these fractional permission systems or you know, language systems like Rust, uh, readers, writers, all of these things are generally cooperative coordination things where you depend on all the participants offering to give up the thing that they need in order to do the state transition rather than having the revoking imposed on them. James. Yeah, I was just going to comment that the fractional permissions or um, since John Boyle is in the room, um, if you call them inverse reference counts, um, <laughs> that, look, that took me 10 years to get. Um, those are clearly global for the reason that reference counts are global. And uh, shilling, I'll, I'll pretend to shilling my postdoc clerk, actually shilling Sophia's work. Um, I think there's an interesting space where you actually make um, topologically local and temporary scope guarantees. So there's a difference, and it's a crucial I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, say that phrase again. Some, what local and temporally scoped? Um, for, the, for the tape, what did I say? I said temporary, effectively a temporally uh, scoped, and in fact topologically scoped or topologically Local oh, okay. Topologically local. Okay. So I'm not saying, um, as with pretty much any reference capability, any, any kind of reference capability system, it says, I'm telling you something about my view of the whole world. You want systems that can say something about my view only of the part of the world that I can see. And that may have something to do with the fact that I was late this morning, um, but we'll talk yeah, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think that's a really important distinction, and there's actually more space there than perhaps we originally Yeah, uh, and and you know the the work that you and Sophia and and others have done on uh, those proof systems, uh, chain mail and necessity, et cetera, uh, uh, you know that's that's been a collaboration um, uh, with you know with this line of work. Uh, and has had a lot of influence on this line of work. The way I think about how to architect the system so that I continue to have cap safety properties that I know I can think about, I can reason about safely is, has very much been influenced by thinking about, well, what if I was writing a chain mail proof of safety for this stuff? And, or, and these, this, this locality in the reference graph and the, the, um, the, the, the temporal nature of the two phases and all that, very much influenced by that work. Okay, excellent. Uh, by now, only 10 minutes remain in the coffee break. Um, so I think that if there are no more questions, maybe we can um, go and grab a coffee and then come back here in a moment. Thank you. Thank you for that. <clears throat>